Ascredit, what is the strangest unsolved mystery? The murders of billionaires Barry and Honey Sherman found dead in their mansion in Toronto by their realtor. They were found with their necks tied, fully clothed on their pool deck, with no signs of a break-in. Well-known philanthropists, Barry was in the pharmaceutical industry, and they donated millions annually to multiple charities. The police originally believed it was a murder-suicide and didn't pursue other leads. The family launched a private investigation that found the evidence didn't support that theory and thus proved police incompetence. As the public became more interested, it was discovered there was a whole family dispute over inherited shares of the Apotex company. The Sherman's nieces and nephews had launched lawsuit over their right to inherit shares, which they lost and most accepted. The Sherman's children hired private investigators BC of the inept Toronto Police. It uncovered an unknown man leaving the property around the time of the murders. The case is fascinating and is the subject of multiple podcasts, a book and movie. Houston Tax Lovers Lane Murders During the summer of 1990, 22-year-old Cheryl Henry met 21-year-old Andy Atkinson through friends at Yucatan Liquor. Andy was home for the summer from Stephen F. Austin State University and the two started dating. On August 22, 1990, the two, who had been dating now for around two weeks, had planned a double date with Cheryl's younger sister Shane. Each couple went their separate ways to continue the night. Shane said she kissed her sister goodnight and told her, I love you around 11.30 p.m. It was what they always did, but when Shane woke up in the morning, Cheryl still wasn't home. And over at Andy's house, he also hadn't returned home. Both families contacted the police. A search was conducted for the couple and for the car. They were in Andy's white Honda Civic. In the early evening of August 23 RD, Houston police located Andy's car after a guard who was doing a sweep of an industrial area called it in. It was parked in an isolated cul-de-sac on Enclave Road, an area often used as a lover's lane. When police approached the car, it was clear something awful had happened. The windows were rolled down. The key was still in the ignition. The seats were laid back and a cassette was in the dash. On the floorboard of the passenger side was a woman's shoes and purse. But most chillingly, there were fresh signs of blood in the car. Just before midnight, the dogs led police to an area roughly 200 yards from Andy's car. A golf club and three golf balls seemed to have been purposefully placed, pointing to pieces of a rotting cedar fence on the ground. Police looked under the pieces of fence and found the body of Cheryl. She was face down. Her clothes had been cut off and tossed near her remains. Her hands were bound behind her back with hemp rope. She had been sexually assaulted and her throat was slashed with three gashes. Near her body was also a $20 bill. The search continued for Andy. The next morning, about 100 yards from Cheryl's body in the tree line, authorities discovered Andy's body. He was fully clothed with his back against a tree and his hands bound like Cheryl's. And like Cheryl, his throat had also been slashed. But the slash was so deep, he was nearly decapitated. His watch and money were still on his person, ruling out the possibility of robbery as the primary motive. After 32 years, this mystery is still unsolved. There is matching DNA retrieved from a 2001 rape victim to Cheryl's killer. I think this one will be solved, probably using genetic information, lay GED match. The 169 big victim of the Oklahoma City bombing. They found an additional leg in the rubble. DNA tests showed it belonged to another victim who had already been buried, but with the wrong leg. The wrong leg had already been embalmed, so they could not get DNA at the time. So who did this leg belong to? All other legs had been accounted for in other victims. They found no other body parts, and nobody else had been reported missing. It was only until 2015 they could get DNA from the leg, but it's still classified as a John Doe. A few conspiracy theories had pop up, like maybe a second bomber that got caught in the blast, but it's still unknown. The disappearance of Brandon Swanson. He was driving home from a party and drove into a ditch. He called his parents and was on the phone with them as he was unsure of his exact location. He told his parents he was outside of a town and they drove over to pick him up. They were on the phone with him as they were driving but were unable to locate him. He went silent after saying, oh shit, and was never to be seen again.
The Tame and Shud murder is so beyond bizarre. They think he was poisoned, but they don't know with what. They don't know who the guy was, because he had no ID on him, and all his clothes had the tags ripped off. Then there's the brown suitcase. The fact that he was seen alive, I think. A full day earlier, in the same spot they found his body. Oh, and the strange number code they don't understand. They generally think it has to do with some hardcore Cold War spy shit, but who knows. The Stone Spheres of Costa Rica. Basically, huge, huge spheres that no one has any fucking clue who put them there, or perhaps more importantly, how. The Phoenix Lights. I'm not a big UFO nut, but this is just fucking creepy. Thousands of people, including the governor, saw them. The governor, if memory serves, was a pilot. And when the government came out with their report, flares, after that some type of plane, the governor, once out of office of course, called bullshit. No real explanation. The Keddie murders. In 1981, Glenna Sharp, her son John, 15, his friend Dana, 17, were found beyond brutally murdered by Glenna's eldest daughter Sheila. She found them, not murdered them, they had been staying in cabin 28 in the Keddie Resort. Sheila had stayed with her friends in cabin 27 and found the bodies in the morning. Her sister, Tina, 12, was missing and her remains were later found some 28 miles away after an anonymous tip was called in. The twist here is that in cabin 28, there were also three small children found alive and unharmed in their bedroom. Most people on Reddit have probably heard about it, but Oak Island, also known as the Money Pit, is a pretty big mystery. In 1795, Daniel McGuinness, of Nova Scotia, saw lights coming from the uninhabited Oak Island, named because, well, it's full of oak trees. He and some friends went to the island and found a large circular depression. So, they started digging and discovered a layer of flagstones a few feet below. On the pit walls, there were visible markings from a pick. As they dug down they discovered layers of logs at about every 10 feet. They gave up at 30 feet. That's just the beginning. The Onslow company picked up where McGuinness and his friends left off, reaching a depth of 90 feet finding layers of logs every 10 feet and layers of charcoal, putty and coconut fiber at 40, 50 and 60 feet. It should be noted that coconuts, and thus their fibers, aren't native to anywhere near Nova Scotia. Somewhere between 80 and 90 feet, they found a coded rock that was translated saying something like 40 feet down, 2 million pounds lie buried. This is getting long, so I'll T L D R it pit floods. And not like a, oh we'll just pump out the water flood. The water comes in from three parts of the island with the tide. Many, many people and companies have tried to reach the bottom, but with no success. If interested, there is tons and tons of info on this. If people are interested in these, I've got like dozens more. This kind of shit has been a fascination of mine since I was around six years old, so let me know if you want more. Probably Terence Woods Jr. He was a 26-year-old production assistant on scene in rural Idaho, with his crew filming a documentary about an abandoned mine in late 2018. The project was slated for completion in mid-November, but he texted his father early morning on Opt 5 the 2018, telling him that he would be heading home on the 10th of October, cutting his stay short by weeks. Later that day, when filming concluded for the day, he was seen speaking to one of the miners, who used to operate the mine, when Terence said he was going to go into the foliage to relieve himself. The prod manager thought this was strange, because apparently he had been acting odd all day. So the prod manager went to check on him. When he did, he noticed that Terence's radio was on the ground and suddenly noticed Terence break into a full-on sprint into the woods down small ledge. The manager tried to chase him, but lost him in the woods shortly after trying. He returned to his crew and alerted the authorities, who launched a full-scale SAR mission that's turned up no clues. The authorities noted how odd it was that he was able to run in such thick foliage. He has never been seen nor heard from again. Here's a wild one I read about recently. Arnold Archambault, 20, Ruby Brugier, 19, and Tracy Dion, 17, were driving through the Yankton Sioux Indian Reservation in Lake Andes, South Dakota, on December 12, 1992, when they lost control and crashed into a frozen ditch and flipped upside. 
down. Tracy, Ruby's cousin, described seeing Ruby exit the vehicle out the passenger door, and while Tracy reached for the door, Ruby seemingly shut it behind her, leaving her cousin in the car. By the time help arrived, Ruby and Arnold were nowhere to be found. Police surveyed the surrounding area and around the ditch in the accident site, but found nothing. Several months later, in March of 1993, Ruby's badly decomposed body was discovered 75 feet from the accident site. To make things even stranger, Arnold's body was found 15 feet from Ruby's, submerged in the water, but oddly, he had hardly decomposed at all. In fact, his clothes weren't even frozen to the ground. Despite police searching the surrounding area numerous times over the months, they'd not seen Ruby or Arnold's body. There was even traces of Ruby's hair found along the road that couldn't have stayed there and gone unnoticed for three months. It's also been alleged by a witness who passed a polygraph test that she saw Arnold at a New Year's Eve party, a full three weeks after the accident. That's what makes it so mysterious. It raises so many questions. Was it natural causes? Foul play? If a person abducted Arnold and Ruby, why didn't the abductor find Tracy in the car? And what are the odds someone would come across the accident in the early morning in a relatively remote area and be able to kidnap Arnold and Ruby? How would law enforcement not notice a decomposing body for months, some 75 feet away? If Arnold did survive the wreck, why was his body found back at the ditch in a different state of decomposition? It's so bizarre. Serial killer Dean Corr has 28 victims attributed to him, but police stopped looking for additional victims because they didn't want the publicity slash scrutiny of having the nation's most prolific serial killer. Corr's family owned a candy factory, and Corr was frequently seen digging around the property and likely buried unknown victims in areas that were later paved over. It has also been alleged by his accomplices that Cole was a part of a nationwide underage sex trafficking ring and that he procured young boys for wealthy clients. Police had absolutely no idea that Cole was involved in any crimes. He was killed by his teenage accomplice after they had a falling out and Cole threatened to kill him. It's a mystery how many victims he truly had because the police wrote them off as teenage runaways. It's also a mystery about the extent of the national trafficking ring, because police didn't pursue those leads either. It makes you wonder how many prolific serial killers have went unnoticed because they chose to prey on the most vulnerable and easily written off victims. What happened to the Waco door? So the Waco siege has many small mysteries that don't make sense. But there is one that sits primarily above them all because this one relates to how it all went south. Everything that happened up to Feb 28 didn't matter nearly as much as this brief object. Feb 28, FBI and a TF agents drove up to the Davidian compound, at which point the Davidians opened the door, allegedly to talk to the agents in hopes of a quick and peaceful solution. However, the moment the door opened, BOTH sides claimed to come under fire. The agents claimed to hear gunfire and rounds soaring overhead, while on camera footage of that day, Bullet impacts can be seen hitting the front door of the compound, and surviving Davidians claim to instantly get showered in metal fragments and wood chips from the composite metal wood door. That door is a key piece in rebuilding the crime scene to establish what happened and find out who fired first. Following the fire on April 29, 1993, the site came under investigation. Prime artifacts being keys to the investigation, chief among them being the front door. Witnesses, including federal agents, recall seeing the door unbolted from its place and loaded onto a U-Haul trailer towed by a black SUV, just like the ones the ATF and FBI were driving, and then the door never arrived to either department. To this day, that whole door has never been seen again. And Eno-1 has ever proven with any certainty which side fired the first shots. The fate of Martin Bormann. Martin Bormann was was a German Nazi Party official and head of the Nazi Party Chancellery. He gained immense power by using his position as Adolf Hitler's private secretary to control the flow of information and access to Hitler. He was last seen in the last days of the Berlin siege in 1945, then disappeared. Finally, in 1972, his remains were found by some construction workers in West Berlin. He was identified by forensic examiners 
and almost 30 years later, the findings were confirmed by DNA analysis. No mystery? Analysis has shown his skull was covered with the red clay type earth, which is non-existent in Germany, but found in South America. Many witnesses from South America recognize Bormann from the photos. The Dyatlov Pass Incident In 1959, a group of nine Russian students went on a hiking trek into the Ural Mountains. When they never arrived at their destination, a search party was sent out and discovered their camp, which had a tent that had been cut open from the inside and their bodies in various locations around the mountainside they had been camping on. Some of them died from hypothermia, but others died from blunt force trauma. Someone or something compelled them to flee their tent in the middle of the night into a snowstorm. In some cases, they were only wearing socks and had no jackets on. There has never been a definitive explanation of the events of that night, nor of the forces that caused them to flee into conditions that even an inexperienced hiker would know was going to lead to certain death. The WOW signal, detected in 1977 and nearly 50 years later, still remains by experts unexplained by natural phenomena in space and therefore a candidate for evidence of intelligent alien life. Since that time, its location in the Sagittarius constellation remains a target for astronomy in efforts to pick up another signal, but so far, none have been again detected. The general consensus is that such a signal must repeat as evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence. However, a viewpoint gaining some popularity is, why should such a signal repeat, given the incredible amount of energy it would take to beam such a signal many light years across space. Common thinking is that humans have powerful lasers and telescopes and can send signals across the universe and vice versa. However, it actually takes a spectacular amount of energy to do this, and even then, the receiving end needs very sensitive, large telescopes to detect such a signal. In this way, it can make sense to not point a signal in just one direction, but rather, in many directions to increase the chances that intelligent life might detect it. Could the WOW signal be one such signal? That's it for this video. Be sure to give it a like and subscribe to Reddit Stories Online for more. We'll see you next time.